mindful that colonization is a process that is still happening today. So we should uh, proceed uh, with that in mind and try to live a decolonized uh, life and carry on these events uh, with a good mind. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. zero privacy, so get over it. <laughs> Who said it and when? 1999. Before social media, before the explosion of digitalization of everything, it was Scott McNally, he's the CEO, he was the CEO of Sun Microsoft Systems. You have already, in 1999, already you have no security, no privacy, get over it. So things have changed a lot since 1999. The world we live in now is just so digitalized and every transaction, you know this, but every transaction you make, every chat you have, every image you capture and send, it's there forever, like it's there, it's digitalized. It's, and people are watching it, are analyzing it, and are using it, and you know that from the ads that keep popping up on your screens, right? People are watching what you're doing when you click on your mouse. So privacy is under enormous threat, not just from the technology, 
but the technology has all kinds of other implications for privacy. And from our government, and the threats in C-51 that Donald and Elizabeth will talk about in some detail are very real. But regrettably, I have to tell you also, from our court system, the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in December about cell phones, which essentially, I have the utmost respect for the justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, but I don't think they all use a lot of smartphones. And I don't think they understand that your smartphone, with all of its, the police, if they get you, if they pick you up now and they have your phone, they can look without a warrant of any kind. They can search your contacts, your chats, your emails, everything you have on your phone. And lots of people are carrying around their whole lives on their phones, and more and more people are going to be doing it all the time. It's a set in the court system. So there's great threats to, to our, our privacy. Um, The, and and the, I guess the big point is that technology is not only eroding our privacy, but it's really forcing us to reconsider what we mean by privacy. It means something different today for somebody who was grown up with a digital device attached to them 24-7 than it does to somebody who wasn't brought up in this world. It, it's, it's a change. It's an important change. The second point I want to make, the big point I want to make, is that the nature of the threats that we're facing with respect to security are, of course, changing. The IT, the, IT the, the threats that are brought on by the fact that we are interconnected are very real. I mentioned some things like child luring online. It wasn't a problem. It didn't exist before we were online. Now it's a real threat to security of our person that our states have to find ways to deal with effectively. So the nature of the threats has changed quite dramatically also. And states exist, if they exist for any reason, it's to protect us, to protect us from whatever the threats are and the threats, which include trying to, to, to defraud an elderly person by getting hold of their visa account number or, 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 or whatever kinds of frauds that, are, that take place in our interconnected world are real. And the state has to protect us from that. Um, the third point I would like to make is that we can't deal with any of these kinds of threats in isolation. Canada cannot, these are global threats. <coughs> the, 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 by definition, the things we are talking about are things that exist because we are interconnected and, 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 and dealing with, uh, with the world in which, you know, where are you when you're in cyberspace? Who, who, who commits the crime? How do, you, how do you collect the rules of it? What are the rules of evidence? How do you prosecute? All the, these kinds of questions have to be dealt, are being dealt with. But you can't deal with them in isolation. And unfortunately, uh, under the present regime in Canada, we've kind of managed to isolate ourselves pretty well, uh, completely, uh, in terms of our ability to act internationally to deal with these things. The, to make progress on these types of issues that we're here to think about tonight, you, you really have to try and develop a, a more common understanding. And that is one of the reasons I'm so delighted to be here on this stage and honored to be on the stage with Elizabeth May, whose early flagging of the real threats represented by C-51 has given the whole nation pause. certainly given uh, the NDP pause, and, and, and I, 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 I have no doubt that Elizabeth's early principled and persuasive arguments against C-51 um, have given us all reason to start thinking about, just hang on a second, why are we doing this? And why are we doing it so quickly? Why are we doing it in this context? We had to build C-36 after 9-11, I was there. And there was a whole range of new what were, what's in, the way that, that those first measures were put in place was with a lot more consultation, a lot more awareness, all kinds of provisions, sunset clauses. What's being proposed here, as you'll hear tonight, is, is, uh, goes much further and ha has real, real risks to all of us. I, I'm going to close there. I just want to say thank you again. I want to say thank you to Elizabeth for standing up on this cause on my own personal behalf. Uh, I want to thank her for the principled position she takes on so many issues uh, and the integrity she brings to politics. She's given me 
faith in politicians, and it's kind of a hard game to be looking for uh, reasons to have faith in politicians if you live in our country these days. So thank you, Elizabeth, <laughs> and thank you for all of you. of Canada Against Terrorism Act. I think they're the same package. I think they're, they go together as the same thing and we should treat them together. What does Bill C-44 do, the one that's now in the Senate? I take it that you voted against it. Yeah. Oh, thank God. You <laughs> <laughs> can't tell with these Green Party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the entire caucus voted yeah. against it. <laughs> <laughs> say? It says three things. The first thing that it says is that sources that are used by CSIS now have an absolute privilege that their identity will never be disclosed. That's very, very, very clear on that. The second thing that it does is it takes the citizenship legislation that was enacted in June and it brings it immediately into force. And the citizenship legislation that was enacted in June allows for the first time revocation of citizenship for criminal acts and anti-terrorism acts. The third thing that it does is it gives uh, judges the ability to issue warrants to allow CSIS to operate outside of Canada. So those are the three things that aren't part of Bill C-51. Now, we are being led to believe that C-51 is a package that is designed to deal with measures that we have, recent measures that we have become very, very familiar with because the media is giving them a great deal of, of prominence. So let me just give you a couple of things that the, that the government is saying uh, Bill C-51 is about. And guess what, I have it here. <laughs> I was just telling Terry, I actually have not read the whole thing. I just can't. It's uh, impossible to do this I, with my little detailed brain. I get, I get stuck. And so I look at the bits that I know I'll understand. But if you go to the beginning of this bill, uh, you will see something that sounds familiar. The second part tells us that it enacts the Secure Air Travel Act. Secure Air Travel Act in order to provide a new legislative framework for identifying and responding to persons who may engage in an act that poses a threat to transportation security or who may travel by air for the purpose of committing a terrorism offense. Who are we thinking about here? The government leads us into this trap of saying, this is an act that's dealing with all these kids who are going across overseas to fight for ISIS. 
But that's who, that, that's what the act is about, right? That it's about a particular group of people who we're very worried about. And we hear about 15 and 16 year olds who are leaving home and are, and are flying overseas to get in something that they, uh, that they don't know. Of course that is worrying. But we're being told that this act is the, is the way to deal with that. If you look at another, another part of the introduction, you see it, it says, it also provides a judge with the power to order the seizure of terrorist propaganda or if the propaganda is in electronic form, in order uh, to order the deletion of the propaganda from computer systems. So what's, it, what's this about? Well, once again, we've heard all about this recently, haven't we, about the radicalization from people who are using the computers to get these kids to leave the country and go, go overseas. That's what, that, that that's what this act is really about. That's what they're, they're leading us to believe. We've seen it in the paper, that's prominent in our mind, they're trying to tell us that that's what the, the legislation is aimed to deal with. Secondly, I think that they, they want to make it very clear that there's a housekeeping exercise going on in here. That things don't work too efficiently in government, they never have, they never will, but it's always good to be able to, uh, to, to uh, uh, make, make things work better. So in terms of the, the Immigration and Refugee uh, Protection Amendments, we're told that the aim is to define obligations related to the provision of information in proceedings under the Immigration Act. What a fabulous thing to do, to define <laughs> obligations. Why didn't we think of that before? <laughs> That's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful bill. You read this and you think this is going to be great. Well, what I'm going to suggest to you is that this bill is not about these things. It's about something that is not recent. It's about something that's been going on for a long time. That the aim of the government is not to deal with recent late 2014 events in Canada. That what the government is trying to do is respond to something. But what they're responding to is judicial decisions that have created major setbacks to their agenda. If you want to put it simply and bluntly, in Parliament, we really don't have any opposition anymore that can stop the government. Outside of Parliament, we have an opposition, and the leader of that opposition is Beverly McLaughlin, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, who the, the, the government goes out of their way to try and demean. What Beverly McLaughlin has said to this government is, if you want something as law, you have to bring it before our court. You have to actually give reasons for bringing it into law. You have to defend these reasons in this public forum, something that doesn't happen in Parliament anymore. And we will tell you, we will ask you questions, we'll ask your lawyers questions about what you are trying to do. If you cannot defend it satisfactorily, we will hold that it's not legal. We have an arena, a forum of public debate because it doesn't exist in Parliament. So, let me try and defend this view that what we have is a government pushing back on the judiciary by telling you the story of what the government is actually responding to in this act. And there's really four cases that I want to refer to, and I want to refer to them quite quickly. First of all, I refer to this idea that CSIS sources should be, remain anonymous. Well, in 2014, uh, Mohammed Harkat challenged our security certificate regime. He took it to the Supreme Court of Canada, and he lost. But the government also lost in that case, and the government lost because they made a pitch to the Supreme Court. We need you to recognize absolute privilege and anonymity for our sources. And the court said, that's not a good idea. And they offered reasons why it isn't a good idea, and I think you can think of some of them. And so what we have, a few months later, is the government saying to the court, well, we think you're wrong. We think this is a great idea. So there's number one. It's a direct response <coughs> to a judicial decision. Number two, I want to go a little bit further back. Omar Kader. In the Omar Kader decision that went to the Supreme Court of Canada, the Prime Minister against Kader, Kader made this argument that even although he is locked away in Guantanamo, when CSIS officers come down to interrogate him, 
they have to abide by the Charter of Rights. And the Supreme Court of Canada agreed that the Charter has extraterritorial effect. So what do we see in this legislation or in Bill C-44? What we see is the attempt to ensure that there is judicial warrants for ceases whenever they go overseas. That's I mean, it's a direct response to the decision of our Supreme Court. This isn't something new. It's something that they have, they've been thinking about and working on for a long time. I want to go even further back. I want you, I don't know if you remember this far back, some students probably won't, but you remember Abhusian Abdul Razik, the Canadian citizen who went to visit his mother in the Sudan. He was arrested by the Sudanese, and he couldn't believe what was happening to him because they were asking him about questions. They were asking him questions about his connections in Canada and his behavior in Canada. He was, he claims, tortured by the Sudanese, and then CSIS arrived again. And CSIS said to him, according to uh, Abdul Razik, that uh, Sudan would be his Guantanamo. He would never see Canada again. He is a Canadian citizen. He was released by the Sudanese because they had no evidence against him. He, he was in fear of his life, so he went to the Canadian embassy. And at this stage, through American pressure, or we assume it through American pressure, his name appeared on a no-fly list in the United Nations. And the Canadian government said, we cannot send you home, and refused to issue him a passport. He eventually managed to get over the, uh, over the passport hurdle, and then they said, we will grant you a, pay we'll grant you a passport if you get a plane ticket. And this man was indigent at this stage. He was begging at the embassy. They knew he wouldn't be able to get there. And the government also announced that because he is on a no-fly list, it would be a crime for anybody to give him money, to give a terrorist money, in order to get him back home. 115 Canadians donated money, including Warren Almond, I should say. What, he was the Solicitor General? I think he was the Solicitor General. 115 people gave him money so he could get home. He took a case to, the, 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 he had to take a case to the federal court. 107 pages Justice then told the Canadian government they were abusing process. There is now a $3 million lawsuit by Abdul Razik, who's now back in Canada, against Lawrence Cannon, the, the, uh, foreign, the, 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 the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, at the time, and a $24 million suit against, uh, against the government. There was no evidence that that, that was used. He was, uh, he was uh, uh, being prevented from, uh, from coming back to the, to the country. What is the no-fly list about? The no-fly list is not about teenagers leaving Canada to get to Syria. The no-fly list is to prevent Canadian citizens from coming back to Canada. Why do we not want them to come back to Canada? Because under the other aspect of Bill C-44, we want to take away their citizenship when they're outside the country. And we want to do it when they don't have access to, to, uh, to legal advice and to the full amount of, of procedural protection they would have in Canada. And how do we know that that's what they're thinking about? Because the British are already doing that. They are already stripping people from their citizenship when they are overseas so they cannot actually come back, uh, come back to the country. That's what the no-fly list is about if you see this as being, uh, as, being a response to, um, as being a response to what the courts have decided. My, my uh, fourth example is, relates to, again, quite an early case. Uh, Hassan al Amri actually is, was one of the uh, uh, individuals who originally challenged with Adil Sharkawi our security certificate uh, regime. And uh, al uh won. Sharkawi and al won in the Supreme Court of Canada. The government was told, rechange the process. What we are doing is we're removing people from the country we are doing so on the basis of secret information. And basically, Chief Justice McLaughlin said to the government, 
The same rules that apply to King John in the 13th century apply to you today. You are not immune from the same rules that, we, that uh, the common law apply. You have to give people a hearing before you detain them and before you actually throw them out of the, of the country to possible torture. So the argument from the court was that at this stage, um, uh, you have to change things. The, the government did change things. Omre had his security certificate quashed uh, again by the courts. And at that stage, he began to apply for permanent residence, or he, 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 he continued applying for permanent residence. And last year, the federal court turned to the government and just said, stop hounding this man. We are not going to allow you anymore to hold him inadmissible. You've been doing it for 12 years, and you have nothing. Now, here's the, here's the key. It's the, it's the security certificate rules that Bill C-51 is trying to change. And they are trying to change it in a way that looks absolutely benign. You remember my reference to defining the obligation. Let me identify to you the key provision that I think explains what the government is trying to do here. Section 77 of the current Immigration Act says this. Very, very simple. The minister shall file with the court the information and other evidence on which the certificate is based. You read that and you think, Okay, the minister is required to, if, he, if they're trying to remove somebody through a certificate, they have to prove that the certificate is reasonable. They, are, they have to prove, produce the evidence of which is based. Very, very straightforward. The new act says, the minister shall file with the court the information and other evidence that is relevant to the ground of inadmissibility stated in the certificate. Say what, indeed. <laughs> it's like the first one says that, that they have to provide the evidence on which the certificate is based. The second one says they have to provide evidence that is relevant to the ground of inadmissibility. It looks like it's saying the same thing. It's not. The first present system is a system that says you have to produce evidence, but you also have to produce evidence about the credibility of the source and how you got that evidence. What the government is saying is, we're going to introduce the evidence on which it's based, and here's the kicker, but we don't want to actually have to tell you that we gained this evidence through torture. That's what the act is about. Paranoid, you think. The man's an idiot. He's paranoid. <laughs> Let me go to CBC website, 2012. Headline, CSIS may use intelligence derived from torture, Tate says. Public Safety Minister Vic Taves, now a judge. Public Safety Minister Vic Taves quietly told CSIS, the government now expects the spy service to make the protection of life and property its overriding priority, and may, under exceptional circumstances, share information based on intelligence that may have been derived from the use of torture. We have a sinister bill here. We have a bill that aims to make decisions based upon evidence that could have been taken by torture. We have a bill that can be used, as it has been used in Britain, to strip people of their citizenship and make sure that they can't get here. We have a bill that tries to counteract the application of the charter overseas by getting prior judicial warrant. And we have a bill that does a whole lot of other things that Elizabeth will tell you about. This is a nasty piece of work. <laughs>
the introduction of security certificate evidence without uh, disclosing that it was obtained by torture. This is a legal analysis that no one else in Canada has yet heard. Uh, Donald Galloway has submitted it to uh, some papers as an opinion piece. I hope it gets published. I'll be raising it in Parliament. Most of us who've been studying C-51 from the day that it was uh, a table have been focusing on the earlier parts of the bill. Uh, first of all, let me read you the full title of Bill C-51. I'll cover the dots that Donald didn't get to. Um, it's, quote, an act, an act to enact the Security of Canada Information Sharing Act, Act 1. The Secure Air Travel Act to amend the Criminal Code, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service Act, and the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, and to make related and consequential amendments to other acts. It is, in fact, an omnibus bill. It's difficult to get through all of it, and up until now, we've been so indebted to law professors who've been, as I've been, diving into parts one through four, and then we all have gotten to part five, the, uh, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act bit. We thought, somebody who understands immigration and refugee law better dive into this. And thank God Donald did, because this is an analysis that nobody else has heard, and we're gonna have to get this out as well. Uh, when Stephen Harper launched this bill, I don't know if you know, it was not launched in Parliament. It was launched at a campaign-style rally in Richmond Hill, Ontario, in which Stephen Harper said, and I quote, violent jihadism is not a human right. It is an act of war, unquote. I don't know if the Prime Minister's language could get any more reckless or dangerous or ill-informed, but the two law professors with whom I've been working a lot and who are, I think every Canadian should be grateful, uh, Professor Kent Roach is a law professor at the University of Toronto. Craig Forsese is at the University of Ottawa. And by the grace of God, they're both on sabbatical. Yeah. They have done nothing but, but work on C-51 night and day. Julian Santino ride again 
and then he puts in brackets, and if that isn't a terrorizing thought, I don't know what is, but then again, terror thought is made illegal by this act. This act is not just about what you put on the website, it's about what you say in a private conversation. So let me walk through it as quickly as I can. Part one is the information sharing provisions. This also amends 17 different other acts, including the F Fisheries and Oceans Act. You might wonder what on earth would section four of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Act possibly tell us about terrorist activity? Well, anything going on, the CSIS wants to know, DFO must turn over all its documentation. You know, maybe someone from ISIS wants a drip net license. We, we, we want to know. Uh, this, this is the section of the act which includes the extraordinarily overbroad definition of activity that undermines the security of Canada. You've probably heard about this one. This is the section of the act that says that it undermines the sovereignty, security, or territorial integrity of Canada, uh, and then it uses examples, such as interference with the capability of the government of Canada in relation to intelligence, defense, border operations, public safety, administration of justice, diplomatic or consular relations, or the economic or financial stability of Canada. Another subheading is interference with critical infrastructure. And at the end it says, for greater certainty, it does not include lawful advocacy, protest, dissent, and artistic expression. And despite my asking, the Minister of Public Safety, Stephen Blady, the Justice Minister, Peter McKay, and the Prime Minister of the House, all of whom actually rose in response to my question, does this exclude nonviolent civil disobedience? They just get up and parrot. You can't read, can the men member for Sacramento Island? We do not include lawful advocacy. Right. So nonviolent civil disobedience is clearly not excluded by this act. Activities that undermine the security of Canada, and this is a this is a whole of government approach to sharing all the information they have about anybody they want to know about. No warrants are required, no inquiry. Okay, moving on part two of the act you've heard about, I'll skip over it at this point. It's the no fly list section. Part three of the act is really where the thought police come in. Part three of the act is amendments to the criminal code to deal with propaganda. Now, as, as Donald says, we're all supposed to be imagining this is a hate-filled propaganda that gets people <coughs> riled up about killing people. But this is really weird language. Uh, this language is every person who, by communicating statements, knowingly advocates or promotes the commission of terrorism offenses in general. Now, not the law experts and professors, and, and or by the way, a letter concerning this bill was also signed by four former prime ministers and I think six former chief justices of the Supreme Court of Canada can figure out what terrorism offenses in general means. Uh, by the way, terrorist propaganda is defined as any writing, sign, visible representation, or audio recording that promotes, advocates or promotes the commission of terrorism offenses in general. It's all very bizarre. Now, Kent and Roach have pointed out that unlike laws that we have against uh, expression, we already limit freedom of expression in a number of defined areas. Hate speech, it's illegal, you can be prosecuted. Child pornography offenses, it's illegal, you can be prosecuted. But there are statutory defenses to being in possession of some of this stuff. And any private conversations are excluded. This section does not exclude private conversations. It does not require any element of willful or knowingly participating. Uh, there are a number of examples one can think of. One of people who are currently fundraising in Canada to send help to Ukraine. Is that towards the commission of a terrorist act in general? Well, it certainly would be against the laws of a number of countries. Let me, I want to move quite smartly now to section four which expands CSIS abilities to monkey wrench. And Donald's quite right, C44 and C51 have to be seen together because up until C44, CSIS only existed to operate within Canada. Those who may remember what happened when the RCMP went rogue and burned down a barn in Quebec, we had the McDonald Commission in 1984, said, you know, we've really got to separate out intelligence gathering from policing. These two things have to be kept separate. So CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, was created to be intelligence gathering only, within Canada only. <coughs> and by the way, one of the other big findings from our commission was the Air India Commission 
when Air India looked at this and said, and the Air India Commission of Inquiry said, we've got a problem here. The bombing of that plane and the loss of 390 lives, I don't know how many, some of you are too young to remember the Air India bombing, but it was, I think, 1984, and the the bomb was placed on board the plane in, a, in Montreal Airport and blew up midair. Vancouver. Vancouver. Vancouver Airport. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Air, Vancouver Airport. Left Montreal this morning. <laughs> Vancouver Airport. And Air India investigation discovered, of course, in the course of the investigation, RCMP had had information about perpetrators. CSIS had had information about perpetrators. Uh, they were hiding information from each other. They weren't coordinating properly. And so there were a lot of very clear recommendations about what should be done to ensure that these intelligence agencies coordinate. There's also very significant advice on how intelligence should operate in the wake of the Maher Arar scandal. And Mr. Justice O'Connor in the Arar situation said, we must have oversight. Right? We must know what these agencies are doing and someone must be coordinating them. None of those recommendations have been put in place. And another omnibus bill that many of you will remember, Bill C-38, the omnibus budget bill that destroyed the Fisheries Act, Canadian Environmental Assessment, you remember that one? It also eliminated the Inspector General for CSIS, which was a, the only actual oversight. There is something called the Security Intelligence Review Committee, or CERC, but it's a part-time board of people who review post facto only some of what CSIS is doing. So now we have CSIS with, you know, we already in the, in the before C-44 and before C-51, the intelligence community and observers have been saying, compared to the EU, compared to the other countries with whom we share intelligence, it's called the five eyes, as in eyes, and it's the Canada, the US, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Of all of those countries, Canada has the weakest oversight. We're the only country with no parliamentary oversight and we got rid of the Inspector General. And now we're saying CSIS can operate outside of Canada. We're saying CSIS doesn't just collect information anymore. Now CSIS has an obligation, if there are under, this is under part four, if there are reasonable grounds to believe that a particular activity constitutes a threat <coughs> to the security of Canada, the service may take measures within or outside Canada to reduce the threat. The, CSIS agents do not need to obtain a warrant to take action to reduce the threat unless they decide for themselves that their actions will violate the charter <laughs> or that their actions will violate a domestic law. There does not seem to be any oversight of a CSIS agent requiring a warrant to break a foreign law. When I pointed this out on the floor of the House of Commons, I have the parliamentary secretary, Roxanne James, actually said, the member for Saanich Gulf Island appears to think that the laws of Somalia are preferable to Canada's charter of rights and freedoms. Like, how you got that out of what I asked, I can't believe. But anyway, uh, the, the, what are the limits on the powers of CSIS agents? Well, if they don't think they're going to violate the charter, and bear in mind, you have to have a fair degree of legal expertise to figure out something that's going to violate the charter. Our Minister of Justice quite often disagrees with the Supreme Court of Canada about what's a charter violation. CSIS agents are going to make this decision for themselves and decide if it's going to violate the charter, they'll go to a federal court judge for a warrant. Otherwise, they don't have to. If it's going to violate a domestic law, they need a warrant. They never have to report back to that judge how the warrant was executed, and they don't report to anyone else because there isn't adequate oversight. So the only limit to the legislation is this. In taking measures to reduce a threat to the security of Canada, the service shall not, A, cause intentionally or by criminal negligence, death or bodily harm to an individual, B, willfully attempt in any manner to obstruct, pervert, or defeat the course of justice, or C, violate the sexual integrity of an individual. Those are their limits. Intentionally. Intent, yeah. So this is, this is, this is a police state law. This is to say we have minimal expectations of evidence and proof. We can expand the notion of what the threat to the security of Canada. CSIS agents can do whatever they think is appropriate as long as they don't think it's going to violate the charter or break a domestic law to interfere with. And some of the things that they do, they can, they can ask for a warrant to both take things away from a place that, they're, that they have access by warrant or to install things. 
That was an interesting prospect. What are they installing? Yeah, I probably should stop here. The, the main points about this are, again, if we were serious about, if this law was seriously focused on terrorism, first question is, can someone find a law enforcement a, a officer or a CSIS agent who can find an example of where they lack the tools they needed for investigation? As Donald have just mentioned, the security certificate regimes are very invasive. They suspend the rights of the accused to an alarming extent. Uh, but let's face it, RCMP officers have had the tools they needed to interfere with and disrupt and arrest the people in a couple of serious terrorist plots in Canada. And I'm glad they did. The Toronto 18, the Via Rail potential assault. The security and intelligence community itself has not complained they lack laws. But what this is is a combination, I believe, of a couple of things. Donald's absolutely right. These are chapter and verse over, essentially overturning what the Supreme Court has said they can and can't do by changing the law so they can use evidence obtained by torture. They don't need to worry about CSIS agents running them up, uh, either in Canada or overseas. But what's extraordinary about this is that when you consider what we learned from things like the Air India investigation, what we learned from the investigation to Maher Arar, we know that intelligence and policing activities are best kept se separate and best kept with someone overseeing what they're doing. Um, it's quite clear that if this gets passed as is, it will not make us safer, it will definitely suspend civil liberties for people who are suspected of a wide range of nebulous threats to security, it will create a chill on speech. This is another one of the areas where Kent and Roach say, if you're trying to stop the radicalization of people, if this is your real aim, you don't want to chill speech. You want people to continue to talk to someone who seems to be bent in the wrong direction. But the way this works is guilt by association, any kind of repetition, any kind of communication, can be perceived as something that brings you into the scope of C-51's uh, measures that were um, brought to us by Big Brother. I think it's the creation of a Franken force. And what we, one last strategic point, and I'll sit down. I'm very grateful and pleased that uh, the official opposition and Commonwealth Care oppose this bill. We need Trudeau to oppose it too. It's critical that the Liberals not vote for this thing because we're going to need to repeal it after the election, and that will become more difficult if one of the major parties has voted for it. So before I sit down, I want to thank Sarah for moderating this, and I want to thank the Young Greens of the University of Victoria for organizing it, and I'm sure we're all ha happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you.